Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm trying to remember what that show was. It used to start off and say that, that the story was true and the names were changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet, Dragnet that's it, yeah. Well, that's, I'm going to tell you something about myself. This is completely true. Uh, now, I don't really believe the zombie apocalypse is ever going to happen. <laughs> but if it does, you want to be near me. Because when, when these tragedies strike, there are this, these varieties of reactions that people have. And on the two extremes, there are these people who suddenly, they're, for some mysterious reason, their hair stands on end, their hands go in the air, they shout uncontrollably and just run in circles. They're totally panicked. They're completely useless. They're, they're going to die. And then there's me. And I really am like this. I, would, I will stop and think, I'm going to take a nap and get ready to deal with this. <laughs> I don't panic. I don't understand the concept. I cannot remember ever be, being even close to panicking in my whole life. Now, that has some great benefits, but then there are some other things about it. And my wife doesn't really care for some of the traits I have. We bought a new camper recently, and we've been camping a couple of times now. And the first time we got ready to go, she said, she said, aren't you excited? I'm excited. And she was, I'm really working hard to be animated here too. <laughs> Just not that way. And I, we were sitting in the car and I said, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> and I, I think that might've been word for word and exact tone. I actually admire people who are more animated and, and get more excited. I, I, I like to see that. So if you do that and you see me looking at you, it's with admiration, okay? I wish I could be that way, but, uh, but I, I'm just, it's just not me. Now, all that being said, um, we, we think about places we'd like to go. And, of course, heaven is that ultimate for us as Christians. But there are all kinds of things in the interim. There are people who, who react differently to going somewhere that everybody would want to go. And I, I said all those things to, to kind of give you a picture of how this next portion of the story is going to go. Some years ago, uh, Lynn had been asking repeatedly about mentioning, uh, let's go to Hawaii. And, and I had lived, I lived up near Lakeside, you know, the, the ski areas up there, kind of a touristy area. I lived some other touristy areas, and, and Hawaii didn't appeal much to me as, as a destination. I was like, well, eh, you know, I saw the Brady Bunch goes to Hawaii, I know what it's like. <laughs> so I, I, didn't, I wasn't really interested in going. But uh, for one of our anniversaries, I knew she really wanted to go. She's going to hate the end of this story. <laughs> and, and I said, I, I surprised her and said, okay, let's go. Now, I'll take you to Hawaii for our anniversary. And we got there, and, and she was really looking forward to it. And I was, vacation, anniversary, and, and the beach, and, you know, all that. But not, I'm not, like I was saying, I'm not overly excited about it. We stepped off the plane, and I turned to her and said, I have to live here. And I was not kidding. She thought I was. We went home. I got to work on getting the house ready to sell and getting things ready to move. And months and months and months went by and this didn't pass. And she finally said, you're really serious, aren't you? <laughs> it took us five years, but guess what? We moved to Hawaii. She's now, since then, she says, I have to be really careful about where I want to go for vacation. 
That's the part she hates. So I, I kind of introduced all that to, to talk about this idea of being open to heaven. Because some people are like me and, and that concept of let's go to Hawaii. It's kind of like, yeah, it's a nice place and I want to go. But then other people are really excited about it and they really want to go. And they've got, a, I don't know, I guess a stronger tug to it. They, they really feel it more. The thing about heaven is we all have our own concept of what heaven might be and what it takes to get there. Now, if you think that's incorrect, ask your friends all around you at work, in your neighborhood, what it takes to get to heaven. I've heard about this story. I don't know that it's true or not, but I suspect it is. There was a teacher talking to a group of children about believing in Jesus, following him, and eventually going to heaven. And at the end of his talk, he started giving the kids kind of this little quiz. And it was, of course, where do you want to go? And they all shouted, heaven. We all want to go to heaven. And then he says, well, what do you have to be to get there? And, of course, he was looking for the answer, Christian. But one little boy that yelled out, dead. <laughs> you know what? That's true. He hit it right on the nail. Perfect answer. Unless the Lord comes back. I, I kind of have mixed thoughts about that, that answer. Uh, and you probably do too. And I think that's the way most of us look at it is, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but I have to be dead first. Oops. Uh, you know, it looks kind of bad. We had our scripture, Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we all so eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're already citizens there. That's our home. And I, I can't really relate totally to that. I, I actually have cousins who have dual citizenship or had. I think at a certain point you have to choose. But growing up, I had cousins who had American citizenship and German citizenship. They could choose whichever country they wanted to live in. And that, that would be interesting to think because when they were born, they were, their parents were American, but they were in Germany at the time. So my cousin is born, he has dual citizenship. For a certain part of his life, he was also American. He was an American citizen and had never even been here. That's a strange concept to me. I don't, I don't quite get that, except for the way it applies to heaven. I am a citizen of heaven even though I haven't been there yet. And we have to learn about heaven from what God tells us because no one else from there gets to come and tell us about it. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 2, it tells us how we should feel about this. For indeed in this house, our physical body, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. We should look forward to going to heaven. And some people don't. The title of this lesson is Open to Heaven. Are you open to heaven? And I wonder if we really consider that phrase very often. I, I don't think I do as far as, am I open to heaven? And it's in the kind of the, right now, if you own a house in the Phoenix area, you're getting these kind of calls, texts, and things in your mailbox. Maybe someone knocking on your door. We've even had that. Knock on the door. Are you all open to selling your house? Just out of the blue. And of course, my, the quick answer is usually, well, no. Now they might say, well, why not? And this, this same thing could apply to heaven. We could say, are you open to heaven? It's not just a quick answer. There's a whole lot behind it. There are people... If you say, are you open to going to heaven? They're going to say no. That boggles my mind. Now, it's not very many, but there are people. And you've heard this phrase. I'm sure you have. And if you haven't, you will. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. No, it's not. <laughs> it is not. People have a complete misunderstanding of what heaven and hell is. Everybody thinks... Not everybody, but a lot of people think 
When you go to hell, Satan is going to be in charge, and he's going to be whipping people or, or you know, d- no. Satan is not going to be in charge in hell. Hell is created for Satan and his angels. It's not even created for human beings. But those who reject God will end up there. Satan is going to be busy enduring his torment. He's not going to be bothering people in hell. It's not going to be happening. There is no reigning in hell. Everybody is going to be dealing with their own eternal torment. So people that say that don't understand the concept whatsoever. Serving in heaven has no comparison. There's nothing in hell that can be even remotely compared to it. Serving in heaven will be an unbelievable, magnificent experience. Now, some people, though, ask this question, and I've had this question as well. You think about what's going on in the world, and they say, why would God create mankind knowing we would sin? Knowing we would need a savior and have to pay such a price to redeem us. Why would God do that? And that took some thinking on my part to kind of come up with that answer. Other than just, you know, looking at scriptures. But to come up with an answer I could really relate to in my heart. Think about the things that we go through as human beings that are parallels. Why would a woman say, as my wife did to me one time, much to my surprise, it was kind of, I don't know, I don't know why it surprised me, but it did. She said, I want a baby. It was a long time ago. She doesn't say that anymore. And that baby, she's now sitting back there with a baby of her own. That's, it was a while back. But that kind of caught me by surprise. And, and some people ask that same question, why? Why would you want to go through the morning sickness and all the discomfort and, and all the things that lead up to the childbirth, which is painful itself? Why would you go through all that? Well, five minutes after it's all done, you know why. Because the outcome is glorious. To hold that little baby, everything else is forgotten. All those trips to the store to buy pickles and ice cream and weird things, the husband forgets too. Oh, I'll get to hold that baby because of the outcome. Think of the surgeries that you might have gone through, and, and probably many of us have had that. There's something going on and it's just not right, and you know the painful surgery, recovery, the therapy, all you're going to have to go through. Why would we put ourselves through that? Because of the outcome. It's going to be better. We do that. So why would God create mankind? And I think that gives us a picture of how terrific heaven must be. God created us, endured our rebellion, went through all of this cursing of the earth, and has dealt with the sin and the tragedy of human life around us all this time and redeemed us by giving his son on the cross. All horrendous things that are beyond our total understanding. Why would God do that? Because heaven is going to be fantastic beyond our wildest imagination. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 7 through 9, it talks a little bit about this. So no matter how you imagine heaven, no matter how it's described to you, even what we see in Scripture, it doesn't even come close to what the reality will be. Paul says, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now that tells me a great deal because I have a good imagination. And I can imagine some amazing things. And to me, heaven in my mind is this progressive, always getting better thing. And, and at different stages of my life, it's, it's had a different image in my mind. 
I used to fish a lot, and I, I keep thinking occasionally, I haven't fished in years, and it, it puzzles me. I don't know why, I just kind of get busy doing things, but I loved to go fishing. And that, was, that had a part of the image in my mind. Now I knew it wasn't accurate, but my thought was, these rolling green hills and this wonderful big shade tree right beside a small river where every cast I caught a fish. <clears throat> And every cast, that fish was a little bigger than the one I caught before. <laughs> now, for you fishermen out there, you can relate to that. Isn't that great? That is a great thought. Some of the best fishing stories I ever have was I caught eight fish in eight casts. I cast, I catch. Cast, it's wonderful. Now, you know what? Heaven is so much better than that. That, now, I tell you, I have a great imagination, but some of you might be thinking, that's the best you could do? <laughs> but it all depends on your perspective. There are all these other questions about heaven and being open to heaven. What is heaven like? And some people think, if I can't get an answer, I'm not sure I want to go. Oh, you want to go. It's going to be better than you can imagine. Some people say, or have asked the question, and I, I, we had a series last year uh, where Terry was dealing with some interesting things in the Life Tree Cafe, and something happened, and the one about do dogs go to heaven got skipped, and it never got covered. And I kind of gave Terry a little hard time about that. I said, I really wanted to hear that lesson. <laughs> he said, no, you didn't. <laughs> That's a tough one to answer. And there, there may not be a definite answer. I have actually seen some people that have pointed to Scripture, and there's maybe some compelling arguments that, yes, there are animals in heaven. Now, do they, you know, not, does Rover die and he gets to go to heaven because, no, I don't, I don't think that. But there are some Scriptures that point, and I think more symbolically than anything, about uh, talking about the Lord riding, riding on a white horse and the lion laying down with the lamb. I think that stuff's more symbolic than reality, but who knows? Some people love animals so much. Just being around animals and having them as companions, maybe that's going to be part of heaven for them. I don't know. Maybe you love animals, but you're allergic to them, and guess what? In heaven, you won't be. I don't know. Now, you know, you can tell this is kind of lighthearted, and I don't have any definite answers because Scripture doesn't either. There are all kinds of references to heaven, but all of them are this veiled image because we cannot fully grasp what heaven might be. One of the worst images of heaven are the medieval things. Chubby cherubs floating around playing harps. That's awful. I'm not particularly fond of harp music. And all those pictures, it's just clouds and chubby cherubs. Like, how boring would that get? Pretty quickly. Especially if you don't like harp music. But that's not what heaven's going to be like. There's nothing like that, I think, in heaven. Uh, and if, if you do a study of angels and you find out what the cherubim are, they're not these chubby little baby looking things. They're pretty frightening and powerful. So that's not it at all. In Revelation 21, there's a passage that you've certainly heard before, heard referenced before. And I'll reference it again, but I, I, I want to share with you my thought on this. This is not a description of heaven. Not at all. And I think that's a good thing in the way I look at this. In verses 9 through 27, you start off in verse 9, and there's a real key here to me that this is not heaven. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. That is over and over undisputable a bit again, uh, among everyone. That's the church. This angel is telling John, I want to show you what the church looks like to God right now. This is a picture of what God sees right now. While we're gathered here 
together worshiping him. And it is a beautiful picture. And I think heaven is better than that. He talks about the heavenly city, the foundation stones, and there's all this material of gold. The gold is so smooth and shiny and in the streets, polished, it looks like glass. And I think of the, uh, the old joke about the, the fellow who died and, and was taking gold with him kind of thing. And when he arrives at the gate, they say, why did you bring pavement with you? <laughs> Something we hold so precious. And we try to gather it up and hoard it and have lots of it. In heaven, that's road. You make road out of that. That gives us kind of this comparison. But in this passage, it's talking about the bride of Christ. And in God's eyes, the road, the path that we walk. And I, I may be off a little on some of my interpretation here, and that's okay. If you don't agree, that's fine. I'm not sure I agree with myself all the time. But the path that we walk, God sees that as shining gold. The paths that Christians walk. A little later, he lists all these foundation stones, the gates around the city, huge pearls. But then the gates are never closed. They're always open. God is always open to people coming into his city. And he lists all these famous precious stones from all over the world to relate to people how beautiful his people and his city are. Think of the, uh, the idea of <clears throat> the ultra-wealthy people in the world and their dwelling places. I did a Google search, and, and I'll give you the exact words. It was easy to find if you want to do this later. Not now. <laughs> Richest people in the world's homes. You get like the top ten people. Bill Gates, some people I don't really know their names, Warren Buffett. Uh, those kind of people. And then it takes you to this website and it lists the, per the people and has pictures of their homes. They're not like any homes any of us live in. Maybe one. Surprisingly, Warren Buffett's home is quite modest, relatively speaking. And that, it's still a really nice house. But he's had that house since 1958. Just because he's become a, I don't know, a billionaire or whatever he is, he hasn't moved up. He's, he's quite a well-grounded person. But their homes are incredible. And, and it would be worth a look for you to just go do that, just to get this image in your mind of what these people live in. And, and it's unreal. Now, the reason I bring that up is because that brings me back to God and what heaven is. Heaven is his home. He is the creator of all, and everything is his. The whole earth, all that's in it. You look up at night and see all those stars with all the planets around them, and who knows what riches in our mind are out there. It's all his for the taking. If he needs it, it's there. Everything belongs to the Lord. In 50, uh, Psalm 50, verses 10 through 12, <clears throat> there are several passages that bring this point out. Job has a passage about this. Uh, several of the Psalms mention this, lots of places through Scripture. But I, just, I like this one because it really is something we can relate to. He says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't even tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. God has everything. And when we can think of everything, it's more than what we can think of. It's all his. So what kind of eternal dwelling place do you think God would have? It's beyond our imagination. Some of those houses I looked at on that website from just men... And what they have done was beyond my imagination. I wouldn't have thought of those things. And yet, here is the Lord in his forever home. And he invites us to come live in it. 
And heaven is, it's so varied, it, it, I think it's, it's something we have to grow into understanding. And eventually, when we get there, we'll go, oh, yeah, I have to live here. We'll step through that gate and it's going to be better than we anticipated. The heavenly city is a city that never sleeps. It never lacks. Doesn't even need electricity. Talk about green. <laughs> God's on top of it. No fossil fuels, no smog, no ugly solar panels. He is its light. There is a beauty in his home that is beyond explanation. Do you think you're open to heaven? Consider it a possibility that you'd like to be there? And what about us? It's going to be good for us to be there. It's interesting what people talk about when you start researching what's heaven going to be like. There was one thing I saw, and, and I won't go into it a whole lot, but it says, oh, we'll still get to eat. Well, I never thought about that before. I didn't really care. I thought, when I get to heaven, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> but they're talking about this marriage feast that's going to take place in heaven. Well, maybe. And then the, the fact that Christ resurrected and his changed body, and we're told we don't know what it'll be like, but we'll be like him. You know, when he came back after his resurrection, he went to the apostles and he said, I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. And he ate broiled fish with his disciples after his resurrection. Does that mean we will? I don't know. But it's something to consider. There are some things we're told plainly about, though. We will never be sick again. If you are a doctor, you're out of business. You get to retire. We will not need you. I have several friends that are doctors. And it, it really happens. You've seen it maybe, experienced it, you may have done it. You run into them in a social situation. My elbow kind of hurts. What do you think? And, and the doctors are like, oh, I'm off the clock. We won't need that. We're not going to have even that sore elbow. Oh, but we live as beautiful as our world is. And I really think it is. It's magnificent in many ways and places. And this is cursed. This is the cursed earth. Imagine what it was like before in Eden. Adam and Eve, where they lived, wow. Must have been really impressive. And heaven is better than that. But here, well, we have thorns, cactus, Sometimes it's a little too hot. July and August. <laughs> sometimes into September. But you know what? Even sometimes it's too cold. Even here. I don't know how many I've shared this with, but when I first moved here, I arrived uh, on uh, Christmas Eve, about almost five years ago now. And I about froze to death. I was so cold, because I'd been in Maui for three years. And we had one day, it was 59 degrees, and I called our son and said, we're freezing to death. He said, turn on the heat. I said, we don't have heat. <laughs> we were cuddled up on the couch in blankets drinking coffee till the sun warmed everything up. So 59 was cold there, and I got here, it was 37. And then we bought our house, and we started getting those calls. We need to come check your heater before it gets too hot, make sure it works. Because we don't want to run it when it gets warm. And I told the guy, my heater's running right now. <laughs> and that was in April. So it took me a while to adapt to this warm, warm temperatures here. Sometimes it's even here in Phoenix, it's too cold. And then people get sick. Oh, isn't that inconvenient? I mean, not you when you're sick. Yeah, that's a problem. But other people get sick. You had plans, and you either have to take care of them or they were supposed to be part of the plan and you have to cancel. But if, if it is you, well, then it's really bad. You, know? you don't get to do anything. Just be sick. What an inconvenience. Not in heaven. When you make plans with somebody, 
guess what? That won't be an excuse. Oh, I can't come over today. I'm feeling kind of, oh, whoops. <laughs> no, you're not. This is heaven. You can't be sick. People suffer. Tough things happen in life. Oh, things that make you just cry. Not even that happen to you, but you hear about what other people suffer through. And it just gets you. It hurts your heart to hear what people have to endure. And people die. But for Christians, that's good news. What do you have to be to get to heaven? Dead. <laughs> now that's kind of weird in a way. But for us as Christians, it, it is this mixed emotions. We miss the people that die and leave us. But we know they're, they're with the Lord. They're getting to figure it out and see it firsthand. But none of those bad things are going to happen in heaven. No sickness, no suffering, no death. And it's hard for us to conceive because we live in, in immersed in suffering and toils and trials and sickness and death. It's around us all the time. So I think it's hard for us to conceive that fully. Of the, the, all those things are going to be absent. But God can do it. And the best part of it isn't that the streets are paved with gold or the foundation stones are all these precious things and they're giant pearls at these open gates and all the beauty that we would think of in a physical, aesthetic beauty way. The best part is the absolute joy of living in God's presence. It's going to be indescribable. Revelation does explain some of the things that won't be there. And maybe sometimes that's the best way for us to understand what's not going to be there. 21 verse 4, he says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We're living in that old order of things and it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away. Things are not going to rot. We're not going to get old. Our knees aren't going to hurt. We're not going to have that back pain. Our eyes will be perfect. Won't that be great? <laughs> oh, I look forward to that part. My eyes aren't that bad. In fact, my eyes are really good, relatively speaking. But they used to be really good. I, I, and lens have always been bad. We'd be driving down the road, and I would read a sign that was a mile away. And she said, you can see that? I'm like, yeah, can't you? I'm like, no. And I feel like I'm blind, and these are just reading glasses 1.25. That's all I need, and I feel handicapped. It's awful. But guess what? I won't even need these in heaven, and neither will you. No more diseases and no more aches or pains. Oh, some people will love this. No shots. No needles. No pills. No doctors. No soreness. No doctor bills. How about that? Means we're not going to need insurance. Don't have to run tests. We'll just be able to enjoy that eternal presence with God. And the best thing is what Jesus told us about it. To think of this magnificent dwelling place, God's forever home, with the Creator that comes up with things that we couldn't even imagine. So there are going to be surprises for us there when we arrive. And Jesus said to us in John 14, 2 and 3, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Ah, are you open to heaven? You know what? You really do have to be dead to get there. More than just one way, really. The most important way is dead spiritually. You have to die to yourself, be immersed into Christ, and then rise to walk in the new life. And that's where... You have your name written in that book of life. And then your citizenship is in heaven. And you're ready to go. It's a beautiful thought. 
And that's why we're here today, to celebrate what God has given us and to remember the price he paid so we have that. This wonderful promise that God made to us, that you can go where I am. If you aren't a citizen of heaven and you need to remedy that, we are eager to help you do that. And if there's another need you have that's causing you troubles and you're not able to see that with excitement, you're not looking forward to heaven because you're struggling too much right now, Jesus said, I'll lift those burdens and these people here will help. If there's any need you have, please 